Welcome to the CJD Foundation Virtual Conference. We thank our partners, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the National Prion Disease Pathology Surveillance Center and our sponsors, Charles River Labs and Ionis Pharmaceuticals. Tonight, we feature one of three panels showing updates from the eight scientists who were awarded grants by the CJD Foundation in January 2021. Everyone who donates to the CJD Foundation and Two Strides for CJD has a part in funding these projects. We also send special thanks to the families who have donated memorial research grants to support these important research studies. Together, you are helping the prion disease community unlock answers to some pressing questions about prion disease. To learn more about family memorial grants or about Strides for CJD, visit cjdfoundation.org or call our office. During tonight's panel presentation, please enter your questions as they occur to you. The panel will answer as many as possible following the presentations, focusing on tonight's topics. If your question is not answered, feel free to email it to us at help at cjdfoundation.org. For information on topics not covered tonight, please visit our conference website to view previously recorded presentations. And now I'm pleased to introduce our moderator, Dr. Brian Appleby, Director of the National Prion Disease Pathology Surveillance Center and Medical Director of the CJD Foundation. Dr. Appleby will introduce tonight's speakers and will moderate the Q&A panel following the presentations. So welcome to the first CJD Foundation grant panel. Um, we're very excited today. We truly have the elite of prion disease researchers on this panel, which shows you, I think, a lot of the interest in prion disease researchers around the world in the CJD Foundation and the importance of the CJD Foundation grant program. First is someone that many of you may know, Dr. Alberto Bizzi. He's board certified in radiology and neurology. He completed a residency in radiology and a fellowship in neuroradiology at the Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland. Since 1997, he holds a tenure position at the Instituto Neurologica Besta in Milan, Italy. He holds a professorship appointment with the University of Milan to teach neuroradiology to medical students and radiology residents. Dr. Beasy was the leader of the work package dedicated to prion diseases within the Europond project from 2016 to 2020, funded by the European Commission, aiming to develop new computational tools for understanding progression of neurologic diseases. The main focus of his research in prion disease is the application of diffusion MRI to diagnose subtypes of sporadic CJD and understand which histopathologic lesions are responsible for the signal abnormalities that are so typical of prion disease. He has been serving as a consultant to the National Prion Disease Pathology Surveillance Center since 2008, and he has read many of your loved ones' MRIs. So he is our consultant that reads the MRIs. Um, in 2007, at a joint annual meeting in Berlin, he received the Outstanding Teaching Award for the lecture Diffusion Imaging and Pathological Correlation to Prion Diseases. Dr. Beasy, I think, especially in the last two years, has dramatically contributed to the field of prion diseases. He's looked at trying to fine tune the diagnostic criteria for reading MRIs of patients with prion disease. He's also looked at how to subtype prion disease, and that's specifically sporadic CJD of all the different forms, which has been very helpful, especially for surveillance purposes and diagnostics. And what he's been focusing more recently on is trying to look at lesion patterns and trying to predict the progression of the disease looking at the MRI. And that leads us to the title of his talk, Early Diagnosis of CJD from In Vivo MRI Using the Trajectories of Prion Lesion Propagation Determined by Computational Models and Machine Learning Techniques. So Alberto, take it away. It is a great pleasure to share with you the preliminary result of this project that received a research grant from the CJD Foundation in 2021. I take this opportunity to thank the families, the president, Debbie Jobs, the medical director, Brian Appleby, and the board of directors for the incredible effort they make every year for carrying out the mission of the foundation. 
I also want to thank the CJD Foundation for referring to us many of the patients that we have recruited for this MRI study. Brain MRI is one of two tests of choice for the diagnosis of sporadic CJD with high diagnostic sensitivity and specificity. However, early clinical diagnosis of CJD is complicated by the presence of several subtypes, which vary by clinical presentation, histopathology, brain lesion distribution and propagation, and illness duration. In this uh, uh, MRI, you can appreciate the bright signal abnormality in the cortical ribbon of the occipital and parietal lobe that is so unique about CJD and allow us to make the diagnosis. In a follow-up study, you can appreciate that there are the lesion have extended to involve also the frontal lobe and the coded nucleus and the putamen on both sides of the brain. This is what we call propagation of the illness that can, show, can be shown very nicely with MRI. We have uh, recently shown in an article that the CJD subtype can be preliminary diagnosed with MRI at the bedside using a diagnostic algorithm. Here in the slides, you can appreciate that the different subtype, MM1, BB2, or MM2, have uh, shown a different distribution of the lesions on the diffusion weighted images. According to the algorithm, the positive predictive value was about 81% for the diagnosis of MM1, 91% for VV2, and a little bit lower, 60% for MM2. I want to remind that the definitive diagnosis of subtype must be confirmed by tissue examination due to some of the degree of overlapping among the different subtypes. In another study, we have shown that the epicenter and the trajectories of prion brain lesion are specific to the CJD subtypes. Of interest, the two most common subtypes, MM1 and DV2, have opposite direction of propagation. Here you can see that in the stage 1, 2 of the disease, the lesions start in the parietal lobe in MM1, and then they extend to the frontal lobe and later to the striatum and the thalami. On the contrary, in VV2, the disease starts in the cerebellum, in the thalamus and the, in the caudate nucleus, and then only in later stages, they extend to involve the frontal cortex and then later the parietal and occipital cortex. The first aim of this uh, research study was to define homogeneous groups of CJD patients with similar epicenter and prion lesion propagation as estimated from diffusion MRI. We applied an artificial intelligent method that identified the epicenter and the trajectory of prion lesion propagation from a data collection of patients with pure CJD subtype. We then validated the result of this method with the ground truth, the autopsy confirmed CJD subtype made at NPDPSC. We studied a cohort of 488 CJD patients at different disease stages and with different brain lesion distribution on diffusion MRI. Here you can see the brain of these multiple patients with different distribution of their lesions. We adopted a machine learning method named Subtype and Stage Inference, SUSTAIN, to automatically define groups with similar disease propagation in a data-driven way. And if you can follow this animation, what the computer does, try to identify how many group of patients we have with similar disease propagation, and then it will follow the propagation of the lesion. As you can see with this line, if we start from these patients, uh, you can see this is the progression of the lesion according to this group. Then from this patient, you have another type of uh, propagation of the lesion and so on. 
sustain identify five groups of uh, CJD patients. Three groups had initial parietal involvement, but had a distinct trajectory of propagation. The first group that we name classic MM1 uh, at the epicenter in the parietal lobe and the frontal and striatum were involved early. The thalamus and the cerebellum were involved only last. As you can see, when we compare this uh, with the subtime known by autopsy, we found that in this group, there were mainly patients with the MM1 and ND1 subtypes. The second group that we name them patient with mainly cortex lesion, uh, the epicenter was still in the parietal lobe and all the cortical region were involved early, while involvement of the striatum, thalamus and cerebellum was rare. And here you can see that in this group, we found mainly patients with MM1, MV1, MM2 or MV2C. A third group that we call cortex and early limbic involvement, the frontal and limbic system were involved early along the course of the disease, while the striatum, the thalamus and the cerebellum were involved only in later stages. Here you see that this group uh, had patients with MM1 and also with the very rare BV1 subtype. The other two groups had the initial subcortical involvement, group four in the striatum, group five in the thalamus and in the cerebellum. Then the propagation of the lesion follow a similar trajectory from subcortical station to the cerebral cortex. These two groups uh, included patients uh, mainly with the BB2 and the MD2K component uh, subtypes as you can see from, uh, from these slides. SUSTAIN is a powerful tool to identify CJD patients with similar MRI features. Thus, it has potential to be used for early selection of patients for clinical trials. To summarize our results, MM1 was the prevalent subtype in the three groups with classic, mainly cortex, cortex and early limbic uh, involvement. BB2 and MB2K were the prevalent subtypes in the other two groups with subcortex to cortex lesion propagation. The aim of the second uh, study was to investigate the mechanism underpinning the propagation of prion lesion in the brain. We tried to address the following question. Does lesion propagation follow major anatomical connection among affected brain regions? Or does it affect primarily highly connected brain regions in extension of the abs? Is it the same disease mechanism for every subtype or MRI defined group? The brain is represented as a network with nodes, the brain regions and links the neural, neuronal connection, as you can see in this cartoon. We simulate the spread of prion pathology starting from one node of the network and following the links according to the strength of the connection. Changing the starting node, the seed or the epicenter, affects the order in which the regions are reached, leading to different progression patterns. For each seed, we record the resulting propagation trajectory and we measure its correlation with those found by SUSTAIN. The results show that propagation trajectories determined by the network model, by the network model match those found by SUSTAIN in two of the five groups identified by SUSTAIN and in particular in the mainly cortex, that is the one with MM1 and MM2, and in the cortex with an early involvement of the limbic system, that uh, is the one where there are patients with MM1 and VV1. 
in the other three groups, probably the mechanism must be different since the correlation and the p-values were not very high, very satisfactory. Other disease mechanisms will be considered in the prosecution of, of this project to explain the mechanism of lesion propagation in the other three groups. We are going to evaluate the degree of centrality. The more a brain region is connecting to the other, the earlier it may be affected. Closeness centrality, the less distant the brain region is to the other, the earlier it may be affected. And also we'll try to use other metrics to measure the influence of a node. For instance, quantifying is spreading power. In conclusion, the identification of different possible epicenter of the disease in the brain, even within the same subtype, may facilitate an earlier and more precise diagnosis. Knowledge of the predicted trajectory of lesion spreading will inform a patient management and prognosis. Will also provide important benefits for prion disease surveillance and a useful criteria for selecting and stratifying patients into arms of future clinical trials. The heterogeneity of spreading mechanism across prion disease subtypes that we show in this preliminary study Father suggests that therapeutic strategies should take into account subtype difference. I want to acknowledge the Jeffrey Smith Memorial Research Grant, the Sherry Maxwell Fabian Memorial Grant, Walter William Memorial Research Grant, the Stride for CJD Grant, and finally the CJD Foundation Grant for providing the grant that enable us to perform this study. And also I want to thank uh, my collaborators at the Best Neurological Institute in Milano, at the NPDPSC in Cleveland, in particular Brian Appleby and Pierluigi Gambetti, uh, the colleagues from the uh, University College of London and King's College London uh, that provided uh, assistance for the sustained model, and finally, Larry Schomberger for the Center for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Inga Zer, who's professor at the Clinical Medical School at the University of Gottenheim, Germany. She's head of the National TSE Reference Center in Germany and the Neurochemistry Lab in the Department of Neurology. She's published extensively in the field of prion diseases, as well as other dementias, and has made substantial contributions in cerebral spinal fluid research, especially biomarkers in dementia at large, but specifically in relation to prion disease. And that's the focus of her current work, which is understanding clinical and pathological differences of prion diseases and in the development of reliable disease-specific biomarkers. The title of her talk is implementation of a blood-based biomarker test for sporadic Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease in clinical practice. So as you are well aware, we have many CSF tests. Um, the best test that we have is RT-QUIC, but for reasons that's not entirely clear to us, it's not very good in blood. So what Dr. Zara is trying to do is try to find all those other diagnostic tests that we sometimes use in CSF and blood and try to come up with what we call a composite biomarker, which is a, a collection of different biomarkers that uh, kind of give you an overall percentage of likelihood of it being a disease. And she's going to present her research for us now. Dr. Zare. Hello, everybody. I'm very grateful that I have the opportunity to present um, the data we obtained in the um, project, which is um, funded by, the, by your foundation. Um, and uh, this project is um, on uh, identification and implementation of a blood-based biomarker test for sporadic creutzfeldt jakob disease in clinical praxis. So what we are doing is we are looking for an easy to apply test, which can be done by in blood um, 
to diagnose um, sporadic Creutzfeldt Jakob disease. This project is headed by Frank Lawrence, who used to be a collaborator in my laboratory, now moved to Barcelona again, which is a very nice city. I completely understand that he has done this. And me, and uh, we are sharing the work and also the results with you. Okay, so the major aim of this project is, uh, can we define a blood-based biomarker and can we implement this test in a clinical practice? We have some potential candidates which might be useful and might be detected in plasma or blood. And uh, you see here the list of these potential candidates. So we have a neurofilament light chain which is a protein which is secreted by the neurons um, and is detectable in blood. It has been established for various neurodegenerative or neurological diseases, but it's probably also very useful for Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease. Then there's a protein tau, uh, GFAP, and some other proteins are listed here. So there are some candidates which can be um, potentially applied uh, as a biomarker plasma, and we need to know how sensitive is, uh, are these tests and how specific are they? I will talk mainly about neurofilament light chain, and um, which is the first one. I have uh, two slides about tau protein in blood, and I have only one on GFAP, which will be shown at the end. Uh, I will not cover the other proteins because first it's too early and second, uh, we don't have so much time to do this. The requirements for an ideal test uh, which will be used in medicine are the test should be stable so it should not be changed by any conditions like uh, when you are taking blood that uh, already some of the um, parameters are changing it should be reproducible which means that when you measure the same sample two times three times four times or if you measure it in different laboratories you get the same results it should be sensitive which means that this test should show that there is the disease that preferably at very early stages. It should be specific, which means that it is not positive, uh, the test is not positive in, uh, in other conditions. It should be quantifiable, uh, which means that we should get some um, yeah, quantitative numbers, which means uh, um, that we can monitor disease progression with this test. And of course, it should be easy to use. It could be, should be applicable in um, any laboratory in the world. So to start with the neurofilaments, NFL, in, um, uh, in uh, our laboratory, we used to um, analyze the preconditions, as I told you before. So first, we tested the stability of this um, test using cerebrospinal fluid and plasma. And we tested this uh, at room temperature, which is shown on the left side, we tested uh, uh, neurofilament concentrations uh, at uh, plus four degrees, and um, we tested also the stability after freezing and thawing cycles, because sometimes we get the sample which was uh, kept in the fridge or it was frozen, and we also need to know if the results are still valid. And what you can see from this slide is that uh, NFL is very stable, um, in cerebrospinal fluid, which is shown uh, on the upper uh, part of the slide, and also in plasma, which is shown in the lower part of the slide. So we always get almost same results, uh, independently on what we are doing with the sample. We freeze them, we keep them for 10 days um, um, at room temperature and uh, many other things. And uh, you see that uh, these um, conditions do not influence the test. So uh, the next slide shows you the inter-assay and intra-assay variation of neurofilaments in plasma. What they have done here, we took 17 samples from patients uh, and we tested in um, two different test assays, which means we tested the samples uh, two times and we tested the, same, uh, the samples two times on the same plate. And what you see here is we get almost same results. So there is no um, big difference, um, uh, no significant variation in these um, intra-assay measurements. Now to the results, because it seems for us that the test is quite stable and a good test. 
Um, now we tested neurofilaments in cerebrospinal fluid in neurological controls and in patients with Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. And what you see here on this screen is that NFL in CJD is significantly high compared to both healthy controls, these are the uh, controls in the middle, and neurological controls, which means uh, patients with different neurological diseases. So those controls are a little bit higher than healthy individuals, but uh, when you compare to CJD patients, uh, then there is a huge difference and the results are very significant. So we see that uh, there is a, a very high, uh, strong upregulation um, of this um, biomarker in the cerebrospinal fluid. Then we were very optimistic and we moved to plasma. Uh, to blood. And because we did not know which is better to analyze plasma or serum, uh, we tested both. And what we have seen here is that um, you see on the left side, you see uh, plasma uh, levels from CJD patients and healthy individuals. And on the left, uh, right side, you see serum levels uh, from patients and uh, healthy individuals. And um, they are also increased in CJD patients, and markedly increased. This is not uh, just a gray zone. It's really um, a high increase in both. But it seems to us that the results are might, uh, a little bit better for plasma than for serum. So therefore, we proceeded with plasma um, further on. This is um, the next slide shows you the rock curve analysis of plasma neurofilaments. It is just to demonstrate uh, uh, the um, um, uh, yeah, sensitivity and specificity of this parameter. This is a laboratory um, calculation which shows um, that um, uh, this is a, a very uh, good biomarker in terms of both sensitivity and specificity because the area under the curve is very close to one. It is 0 0.923 um, uh, in plasma. Uh, and um, therefore we can really be very optimistic that we have a good test here. So, and now I would uh, like to share with you some data from a case report we um, had uh, obtained uh, during our studies. And this was um, a patient um, with, um, coming from a family with fatal familial insomnia. And this patient um, came to us a um, long time before he, um, uh, he became symptomatic. He knew that he has a mutation. He was a mutation carrier and he came for several years to us for examinations. He wanted to be, uh, we tested him neuropsychologically and, um, uh, and clinically. We did MRI and uh, we also took um, uh, blood um, or he donated blood um, uh, on several occasions. You see on the right side of this um, uh, of this uh, figure, you see um, uh, the plasma uh, NFL levels uh, from uh, this patient. So um, he uh, when he came uh, to us, um, um, uh, yeah, three years before onset, uh, they were at normal range. This is point one uh, uh, on this uh, graph. Um, point two is two years before onset, point three is one year before onset, and point four was a clinical onset. But at that time, he had a very mild symptoms, and we still did not believe that this is onset of the disease because he had a very mild sleep disturbances, and he had um, was also um, strong, uh, very um, uh, depressed about that. Um, but we could not um, find any evidence that the disease started already. But some um, weeks later on, uh, it became uh, clear that he is suffering from um, fatal familial insomnia. And what you can see from this graph is that uh, we have a mild elevation of neurofilaments um, at this time point when uh, he had subtile clinical symptoms and uh, um, the levels increased with disease progression. Uh, we have analyzed this for neurofilaments. Then later on, we also analyzed other biomarkers, which we can um, define or we can analyze in cerebrospinal fluid, uh, in, uh, sorry, in plasma. And this was tau, YKL40, S100B, GFAP, and this is shown on the left side. So what you can see, all these markers are not uh, indicative for any um, 
pathology, so they stay normal this uh, time, but only the neurofilaments were increased in this time point, which um, um, yeah, shows us uh, that this might be a potential test which um, is uh, positive very early in blood. And of course, we explored this further. We took uh, samples from our cohort, uh, from patients with fatal familial insomnia. This is, of course, now this cross-sectional uh, part and compared with healthy controls. And you can see that uh, these levels are uh, highly elevated in um, plasma in patients, but these are symptomatic, clearly symptomatic patients. Okay, then uh, we also have, we have an animal uh, model uh, in our laboratory, we have uh, plasma samples from animals, from mice, which are infected with different strains of um, uh, sporadic uh, Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease. These are um, uh, TG340 PNP129 MM mice, which are infected with M1 strain, and uh, VV mice, which are infected with VV2 strain. And uh, we collected uh, plasma um, from these mice at different time points. And what you can see here, that these plasma levels, they are increasing um, at, uh, at the time when uh, these animals become uh, symptomatic, which is, uh, again, uh, shows us that uh, there is a clear co correlation with, uh, of, the, of this marker with uh, disease uh, start and disease progression. Um, apparently, this marker is not um, uh, pathological or in the preclinical stage, but it seems that we have here something which starts very early in the disease. Okay, then I, I move to a second uh, parameter just to show you the two slides on that, which is plasma total tau in sporadic Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease. This has been done um, uh, in some studies already. And what we have uh, analyzed here also is that we analyze total tau in uh, sporadic Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease in plasma. And what we can see also here in the middle of the screen is that the levels are clearly elevated in Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease, but not in other neurodegenerative conditions or other dementia types. So this is another potential biomarker for sporadic Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease. Uh, same, uh, we analyzed uh, this marker here for uh, in our mouse model, as I presented you for neurofilaments. And it also seems that uh, here we have an increase um, of the um, uh, levels of tau during disease progression. And it seems that the increase starts with the clinical symptomatic phase. So now my last slide, uh, just to show where we are moving on, GFAP is another biomarker, which is just in discussion for Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease. And here we obtain um, very interesting results for um, cerebrospinal fluid. But here we, um, what you see on this slide is in, uh, on the left is our CJD patients, uh, healthy controls and neurological controls and levels are down in CJD patients in CSF. Uh, so this is an, um, somehow an opposite biomarker um, than neurofilament, tau, and other what we know today. Normally we are looking for increased levels of some biomarker. Here have one biomarker which goes down. And of course we need to understand this and, uh, and to analyze further because we also want to know if um, by combination of some biomarkers we can also um, obtain much more precise diagnosis um, of the disease. Yeah, with this I would like to thank um, uh, you for your attention, uh, also for the possibility to perform this work, uh, which uh, we are doing and uh, which is supported by the foundation. And of course, this work was not done by myself alone, uh, but by many, many people who were involved in my laboratory um, uh, in, um, in Göttingen. Uh, on the left side, the second uh, from the left is uh, Frank Lawrence uh, at that time when he was in uh, Göttingen. And on the right side is a PhD student, Seske Kanaslan, who performed all the tests. Uh, and I would like to give spe special thanks to her and to Frank for this, um, uh, for this work. And yeah, that's it, what I wanted to present. And I'm I will be very happy to answer questions.
Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Simon Mead, who many of you may know from last year, who gave the CJD Foundation keynote speech, which is very pertinent to his current project. Dr. Simon Mead completed his medical training at Cambridge and Oxford Universities and a PhD in the genetics of prion disease at the Imperial College of London. Dr. Simon Mead is a consultant neurologist and clinical lead of the UK National Prion Clinic based at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery, at the University College of London Hospital. He's also working at the UK Medical Research Council's Prion Unit, where he is deputy director. His research interests include treatments and designs for clinical trials in prion disease, the discovery of biomarkers, genetic and epigenetic factors that cause or modify prion disease. He was made professor at UCL in 2014 and NIHR senior investigator in 2018. The title of his project that he'll be presenting on today is Genome-Wide Association Study of Age at Clinical Onset in Inherited Prion Disease or Genetic Prion Diseases. Essentially, uh, as you know, uh, the age of onset of genetic prion diseases can vary quite widely. So we really want to know if there are different things that may cause someone to get the disease earlier than someone else with the same mutation and maybe even within the same family. So Dr. Mead is using a very similar approach that he did with sporadic CJD that he presented on last year's conference to this project where he's gonna be looking at other genetic risk factors outside of the prion protein gene that may influence age of onset and genetic prion diseases. It's my pleasure to present Dr. Simon Mead. Brian, thanks very much for that kind introduction. So I'm going to talk about our project to uh, help predict the age of onset in inherited prion disease. So uh, to summarize this presentation, um, I'm going to talk about the inherited prion diseases and cover some of the other terms that are commonly used to describe um, groups of patients in uh, of this disorder. And um, the experience of inherited prion disease in a specialist clinic in the UK and compare that to what would be expected elsewhere in the world. I'm then going to focus on the age of onset of disease as a key variable and how unpredictable that is. It's important um, if we are to help people with this condition that we try and understand age of onset better uh, and what might determine the age of onset. And through those questions was conceived this project, the, the Inherited Prion Disease Modifier Project. I'm gonna describe um, what we're trying to do uh, and how we're going to do an analysis and try and detect determinants of age of onset and then an update on uh, where we are in the project right now. So the Inherited Prion Diseases are a really diverse group of um, neurodegenerative disorders. And there are a number of different terms used for groups of patients within um, the overall category. Um, the most, most common worldwide is, is familial CJD. And patients with this disorder present with a spectrum of problems with thinking skills, jerky movements, and balance problems. And the most common mutation that's found um, that causes the disorder is, is called E200K. And this refers to a position in the gene that encodes the prion protein, the prion protein gene. Perhaps the next most common um, is gerstmann straussler scheinker disease. And this refers to something quite different, uh, a progressive loss of balance associated with stiff, painful legs, often with loss of feeling in the legs. And only later in the disease does uh, the thinking skills become affected. And that's typically associated with a mutation at position 102. Um, familial fatal insomnia is also relatively frequent in the inherited prion diseases worldwide. This is associated with a progressive insomnia, but changes in blood pressure, pulse, temperature, sweating, and other elements of the autonomic nervous system are affected, along with movement problems and dementia. It's a relatively rapidly progressive condition. But, you know, those are the, traditionally the most common types, but also we're aware of octopeptide repeat insertions that seem to have quite a distinct phenotype that doesn't, doesn't fit with the others, often a very slow disorder of behavior and learned movements that might last over 10 or 15 years. And we've also described a particular type of mutation, one that truncates the protein um, associated with a non-neurological 
presentation, loss of feeling in the feet and drops in blood pressure on standing. So a really diverse set of different clinical disorders. Now this is, this is a complicated slide, but what I wanna get across here is that a lot of what determines the type of illness that might happen in the inherited prime diseases is the exact code for the mutation. And, and we know about an awful lot of different um, mutations or coding changes in the prion protein gene over the last 30 years. All of the inherited prion diseases are caused by mutation of the prion protein gene. Some we're very, very confident about and we understand relatively well. Others have perhaps found just only in a handful of individuals around the world and we're still uncertain about exactly what risks they confirm. So a typical family tree looks a bit like this with the uh, Roman numerals on the, on the left referring to different generations of a family, circles referring to females and squares, males, and then vertical lines connecting to uh, children. And typically in the inherited prion diseases, they're transmitted in families as what's called an autosomal dominant trait. And what does, it, what does that mean? It means the risk for each generation is 50% is of inheriting the mutation. And as you can see in this generation three, uh, this uh, woman in the previous generation, this mum um, had eight children by two different men and, and four of those children did eventually develop the disease and die from it, four were unaffected. And it's only those affected individuals that can pass on uh, the mutation to their children. Some of the pedigrees um, that I look after or help look after patients in, uh, in the UK are very, very large and, and there may be several hundred individuals at risk of inheriting a mutation in these pedigrees that here I just illustrate connected by people that died from the disease. So um, in the UK in the last 30 years, we've diagnosed 235 individuals uh, with a prion protein gene mutation and inherited prion disease and know that the age at which the disease started. That's across 21 different mutations, which fall into uh, four different groups. The, the large insertional mutations, E200K I talked about that causes familial CJD and P102L that causes GSS or Gerstmann Strausser, typically. Um, globally, the situation is perhaps a little bit different in that um, the D178N mutation that can be associated with fatal familial insomnia is much more common in some other countries than in the UK. And the octopeptide repeat insertions, the six OPRI mutation I refer to here is, is perhaps less common in other countries than it is in the UK. But what I wanna focus on for the rest of the talk um, is the age of onset of, of these. And here I show a, a column chart showing the ranges of ages at which those 235 patients presented with, with illness. It's highly, highly variable. And the, the average is in the mid fifties, but the range is extraordinarily from, from 26 up to, up to 90, which obviously makes a whole world of difference for the person that got the disease from the start of their adult life through to the, um, the very end of it. So about half of this variation appears to be explained by exactly which mutation is found, but half of it is unexplained. And even within the same family, there remains an awful lot of variation that's unexplained. So is the tendency within a family to have an early start of the disease or a late start of the disease over time in life that could make a whole world of difference? Is that, is that predictable in any way? And you know, what, what are the anecdotal experiences of this first? Well, anecdotally, I don't know of environment, obvious environmental triggers. And certainly taking clinical histories from these patients haven't, hasn't revealed that in everyday clinical practice. I also have seen marked variation in parent-child pairs such that in some circumstances, the child may develop the disease before the parent uh, because the parent had a late onset type of disease and the child an early onset. But can we be a little more scientific and statistical about this? And, and there are two papers um, published that, that attempt to answer the question uh, of whether or not parents and children, and obviously they share that if they're both affected by the disease, they will share the same pre and protein gene mutation. But aside from that, do they, sh they share a tendency to have an early or a late onset type of disease? And actually the, the, the evidence from 
these um, these looks is somewhat mixed, unfortunately. So it's a little inconclusive. So so in work I did with a young doctor uh, about 13 years ago, we found some evidence that there appeared to be a correlation within families. But a later look with Eric Minical and several other collaborators around the world, we we didn't confirm that um, when we looked in. But but there were important differences between these studies, and I think it's it's still not completely clear what the truth is. So what about, so we don't know for sure whether or not there might be determinants of age of onset in the inherited prion diseases. What about in similar diseases? And th there are some nice papers coming out in related disorders. So I'm not talking about prion disease now, other kinds of disorders like say breast cancer or, or a familial tendency to having high cholesterol um, that have investigated links between common and rare disorders. So, so broadly the risk of diseases fall into two categories. One is you know, a single mutation like what I've been describing in the inherited prion diseases that really determines, are you going to get this disease or are you not going to get this disease, whether you have it or you don't have it. But in addition, there are common genetic variants. And, and you know, there may be hundreds, if not thousands of these that determine your risk for, for, for an illness or, or a, say, a, a trait like blood pressure or, or altered cholesterol. Now, individually, these genetic variants that explain differences between all of us in the population may have really minimal effects uh, on, on an individual disease risk. But collectively, if you can summarize them all together, they may amount to, to very significant risk. And there are statistical techniques that have now been developed to summarize the totality of one's natural genetic risk for a condition is something called a polygenetic risk score or PRS. Now, this paper that I'm, I'm showing on the left shows that um, in the Mendelian diseases, meaning the ones that are inherited with a gene mutation in families, are typically modified by the sum of all the small uh, risks conferred by common genetic variations. So there is an interplay between your genetic background and um, a, a mutation that's inherited within a family. Now, this isn't this hasn't been shown for the inherited prion diseases, but it has been shown for several other uh, related what's called Mendelian or familial disorders. So what about the polygenic risk score? Um, has such a thing been developed in CGD? Well, yes, recent in recent years, um, uh, collaborators have joined together to make large collections of, of DNA from patients that died from sporadic CJD. And these have been analyzed with genetic techniques to derive a polygenic risk score for sporadic CJD. Actually, it's, an, it's not useful in predicting your risk of sporadic CJD in the population. And, and the main reason for that is because thankfully the condition is so rare. However, this polygenic, polygenic risk score may be useful in uh, modifying the risk of inherited prion disease or the age at which the disease starts. So that's where uh, the concept for this project came from. So we have a large case control study of sporadic CJD. So we have this information about the overall genetic risk for sporadic CJD. We can derive polygenic risk scores. If we then were able to acquire inherited prion disease samples associated with an age of onset, um, we could then run genome-wide arrays to determine uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, common genetic variation. We can fill in the missing genetic variation using computational techniques. And then we can test whether this polygenic risk score or, or, or um, individual candidate genetic variations can um, alter uh, the age at which the illness starts. Of course, we're gonna have to account for the particular mutation, the sex, um, of individuals, their genetic background, you know, their, their ancestry and the contributing side, but, but we have established techniques to account for those variables. So what about, it, it's not just inherited prion disease patients, we can use this also information that we can learn from people that carry uh, prion protein gene mutations, but thankfully haven't developed the disease until relatively old age. And I've, I'm suggesting a method here through which we might be able to use um, the, the apparently protective information, the, the protective genetic variables that these individuals might have to, to combine in a single analysis so we can look at both the determinants of an age of onset in uh, people that sadly developed 
um, the inherited prion disease and additionally look at those individuals that carry prion protein gene mutations but, but survived into older ages without uh, any signs of the disease at all. So where are we at the moment? So we're in a phase um, of collecting samples from around the world. I'm really pleased to report that there was a pretty much universally po positive response to a request uh, to join forces uh, and do this research together. I've listed individuals that have um, already contributed or plan to contribute samples. We have 977 already. The target was achieving a thousand samples. There are more that are due to arrive, so I'm confident we'll hit our target. And, and you know, I expect before the end of the year that we will conclude the sample collection um, uh, part of the project and go on to processing the genome-wide arrays. So we'll finish there um, and uh, say thanks. I'd very much like to thank all the contributing sites, the genetics team at, at the Institute of Prion Diseases, the clinical team, um, John Collins is the director of the institute where I work, and of course, most importantly, I'd like to thank the Jeffrey and Mary Smith Family Foundation and the Davy Nock Memorial Research Grant and um, Strides for CJD and of course the CJD Foundation. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you guys very much for the enlightening uh, presentations that you guys gave. I think you all did a very good job of presenting what question you're trying to answer and what you're going to do about answering it. So uh, a couple questions. Um, Dr. Beasy, in your presentation, you talked about how some of the subtypes that we know of in sporadic CJD, like MM1, MM2, which uh, families can learn about more at the CJD Foundation's website, that although we consider them the same strain or the same subtype, that some of your findings show that they have differences in their epicenters of the MRIs. Could you maybe explain what you make of that? Um, if we look at the first, uh, just to summarize the results, uh, uh, we did this study just looking at the MRI uh, without uh, keeping in consideration the result of the autopsy. We use the autopsy only for validation. And so if you look only at the epicenter and the propagation of lesion, the way we reconstruct with MRI from such a large group of patients, we found five groups. Three groups uh, uh, share the same epicenter in the parietal quarter. And uh, the major representative of this group uh, is MM1. That means uh, that uh, MM1 can show three different trajectory of propagation of lesion. One that is really typical of MM1. A second one that you can find also in patients with MM2. In other words, they have uh, uh, the epicenter in the parietal lobe, and then the lesion spread from the back of the head anteriorly to the frontal lobe and to the temporal lobe. But uh, they usually don't get down in the subcortical structure. And then we have a third group where MM1 is a, a share the propagation of the lesion with VV1. In other words, the lesions start in the parietal lobe again, and then they involve very early in the disease, the uh, cingulate and the insula. And only at a very late time, if ever, uh, they get to the subcortical structure, the basal nuclei, the thalami, and the cerebellum. For the last two groups, they, uh, they uh, may start in the cerebellum or the thalamus, or other, uh, another group starts in the basal nuclei. From the subcortical nuclei, the disease spreads to the frontal lobe and then posteriorly to the parietal. In other words, it's going exactly the opposite way of the uh, first group, uh, the, the one that is the very typical uh, one and also is the one with the largest number of cases uh, that is typical of uh, uh, MM1. 
Great, thank you for that response. So what is nice is that you can identify the propagation of lesion with MRI. And uh, if you try to, I mean, you, you ask the machine, how many groups with similar epicenter and propagation do you find? And the answer was uh, five groups and uh, with some overlapping between the pathological groups, as uh, I explained earlier. So I, say, I think it's a kind of nice. It tells you that the propagation is a very important feature of uh, subtyping. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, um, someone asked about upcoming clinical trials in prion disease. And I would just refer that individual to the CJD Foundation's website. There is some information about some planned upcoming clinical trials um, from a pharmaceutical company that they can find there. Um, but this is a question for, for Inga and Simon, because you both have extensive experience in this space and perhaps Inga, you can start off answering this question. And that is, what is the utility of looking at biomarkers when interpreting whether or not a treatment is helping in prion disease? Yeah, thank you, Brian. Um, I think this is exact the situation where we need a biomarker because of course, when we, there is, a, for example, um, we will probably have different kinds of studies in future when we, uh, once we have a therapy, there will be probably a study um, or therapeutic option for mutation carriers that this might be different from those uh, suffering from sporadic form of CJD. Also in, in the study design, we need to um, acknowledge this, that uh, yeah, this, these are just different settings, um, how to plan uh, this type of study. And the situation with mutation carriers is, of course, that we um, need some objective um, uh, criteria uh, when the disease starts. And uh, everyone knows that uh, there is uh, not a clear um, starting point. There is always a kind of a gray zone when... Uh, uh, the clinicians are not really sure that the disease already is going on or, you know, like in our patient I presented to you, we were really not convinced that this was already the beginning of, uh, of fatal familial insomnia. And for this, we need some um, objective criteria. This could be the MRI when we see changes, but this could be also a biomarker. And of course, the biomarker, preferably in blood samples, um, is a um, tool to, um, yeah, which can be applied frequently, which can be done several times, and uh, where we also can get some information that there's really an organic process going on. And this is, I think, one application in terms of trials. And the second one is, but we need to see if we have biomarker for this, but uh, also um, uh, could be the application that you could see, if you can see that the biomarker is um, yeah, not only high, but also maybe also the, um, going down. So um, to monitor the response to the disease, uh, to, to the modifying trial is also important. And also for this, we need a biomarker, but uh, this is a bit more complicated than for the diagnostic purposes. Thank you. And Simon, do you, do you have anything to add to that? Um, well, I, I agree. I agree with everything that Professor Zer says. Perhaps, you know, I would emphasize the importance of biomarkers as tools in clinical trials by reference to diseases where we've done really well. And um, if I was to pick a couple, I might pick um, HIV AIDS, whereby being able to measure the virus that is the cause of the disease and give treatments and change treatments to suppress the measurement of that virus in blood. We've essentially converted what was a universally fatal disease into a curable one. And by analogy with CJD, is it possible at some point we may be able to measure continuously, perhaps even in blood or spinal fluid, prions and keep them at a minimal level and see benefits? Um, Another disease I might pick with a different type of biomarker would be multiple sclerosis. You know, that, you know, going 20 years ago, that was practically an untreatable disorder. 
It's now incredibly treatable with maybe 15, 20 different treatments available. And those treatments were kind of ranked, optimized, selected and chosen through clinical trials because the treatments had a really strong effect on um, brain scan lesion profiles as biomarkers. And, and, you know, that's another illustration, a different type of biomarker, of course, and neurofilm and light of, looks really good in multiple sclerosis as well. But, but I think historically, the rapid progress in that disease was seen through the use of an imaging biomarker. So I think two examples of diseases where we've seen the kind of progress we really love to see in CJD transformed by the use of biomarkers. I guess the majority of prior clinical trials in prion disease have looked at survival as the endpoint of the study, whether or not the patient uh, lives longer or not. And with a rapidly progressive illness like CJD, the delay to diagnosis, um, sometimes family members will ask, well, what if you have a treatment that could potentially help, but you don't know it because it's being given too late? Is that something that biomarkers might be able to help with? Shall I say something on that? Yeah, th I mean, Brian, perhaps if I weighed in with that one, I mean, I, I think I think there's biomarkers and biomarkers, and I, I, I agree, and biomarkers are different tools. They're, they're like a, a toolkit for laboratory medicine. And, um, you know, it's it's through the use of biomarkers that we will get early in pre-symptomatic diagnoses, as Inga was describing with, with her blood tests. And, and that's, you know, it's, Imaging and RT Quick are already very useful at early stages, but maybe we can even take it further. Maybe a blood test would be needed to take it even earlier than that. One that could be used at the, used at the very first suggestion that there might be a, a rapidly progressing cognitive disorder. You know, even in primary care. I, I, you know, I know this might sound fanciful, but you know, if we're going to get there really at the very earliest opportunity with an intervention. Um, diagnostic biomarkers uh, for the very earliest stages could have a role. And Alberto, I'll go back to neuroimaging for one second. There is one question that we get repeatedly. And uh, since you were on this call, I, I think we have to give it to you. And that is, why is my loved one's MRI always misread? So I can put you on the spot. Not misread by you, by the way, misread by the original reader. Okay. The main reason is because it's a rare disease. I mean, the people that are attending this conference, they see a lot of cases because they are specialists in comparing disease. And so if you look at these images after a while, you learn how to read those. And... I think the findings on diffusion-weighted images are very unique and easy to make the diagnosis. Sometimes when the signals are normally are very subtle, uh, I saw a case uh, while I was waiting for this conference and it was really, really very subtle. I mean, sometimes you really have to push a little bit, I mean. But uh, I think if you, since it's a rare disease, uh, a lot, unfortunately, a lot of radiologists and neuroradiologists don't think about CJD because they don't see many cases at their institution. So what we need to do, we need to tell them that anytime they see a signal abnormality in the cortex or in the basal nuclei in patients that have some uh, deterioration, some loss of cognition, they need to raise the suspicion of uh, CJD because, I mean, is uh, the, the diagnosis should not miss any longer, especially for the family, because they get upset when, uh, when they get the diagnosis six, nine months later. And so since we, we have to educate, probably we have to make, make CJD on the board the questions. If we put the, the question uh, very often on the board question, maybe the radiology will learn and we'll think about it. That would be nice. So since so we have other people from other countries, uh, Inga and Simon, do you also experience this? Where, of course, you're a reference center that sees these illnesses and recognizes these scans, but do you also see kind of uh, underdiagnosis of MRIs in the community? Yeah, should I start with? Um, 
I, uh, it is exactly the experience we also have in Germany in our reference center. So um, I think in the meantime, it does not happen that often as it used to be maybe 10, 15 years ago, but, uh, but it still happens. And um, sometimes people even describe these changes and these abnormalities, but they just don't think of CJD. And um, we have other differential diagnoses like, I don't know, epileptic fit, ischemia, whatever. And um, these are yeah, more frequent diagnoses than CJD and therefore they don't think of it. Right. I know it is extremely late for all of you right now. In fact, I think for all of you, it's actually now currently Wednesday. So I want to be mindful of that. But the theme of this year's conference has been, what do we have to be optimistic about? And so I would like to start with each of you, if you could talk about um, your experience in the field and what you're optimistic about in the future. And I'll start to my right, which would be Alberto. And I think uh, the future is bright because, uh, I mean, uh, we have learned that medicine makes a lot of progress and usually these progress are faster than uh, we predict. Uh, we saw an incredible improvement in the way to diagnose a CJD in the last 10, maybe 20 years. And uh, I cannot tell you which, what will happen in the next 10 years, but I know for sure that, that there will be some improvement. I mean, uh, I think that we, uh, the there will be some improvement in diagnosis. And I hope there will be improvement also for treatment that is uh, very, very important. Inga? Yeah, um, I just can echo this. I think we made substantial progresses in last years. Also, of course, because uh, in this rare disease, there were so many people working together. And because this is, um, yeah, I would say, um, a joint achievement of many, many groups around the world. And um, I'm uh, optimistic because I see that uh, we, may, uh, we, we made this progress in diagnosis. I hope we will also make something comparable with treatment and with uh, these new uh, methods um, which are emerging with gene therapy. I think um, we are probably on a good, very good way. Of course, this is a long road, but... Um, uh, when you think 20 years ago, nobody was even talking about treatment. And now we are talking about how to design an optimal trial. So I think um, we are on a good way. And Simon? Yeah, I'm, I would just uh, extend those comments and uh, share my own optimism. I think we're going to live through an era of some really exciting experimental treatments in CJD. I mean, look, how can you say a disease as awful as CJD that something's exciting? But, you know, this is what we've dedicated our career to, to potentially changing the outlook for a disease as awful as this. And, you know, we know exactly what the target is. We have to hit prion protein, we have to take it out, we have to stop it from joining in this pathogenic process. And, and you know, it does seem as though modern biotechnology is going to deliver a range of tools that are able to take out proteins. And, you know, it is going to be exciting as an academic clinician to see those enter the clinic and see whether we can really start to turn this around. And I, I think that's going to happen and that within the next 10 or 15 years, we are going to see a, a wave of treatments enter the clinic, um, you know, to be tested. I'm not saying I know something's going to work in that time, but there's going to be a wave of things that will be tested. Yeah. And um, that's cause for optimism. I have to say it's a little ironic that you all are on the same call because I think much of my optimism stems from much of the work that the three of you have done, especially over the last five years, that I think has actually given rise to us being optimistic. So on behalf of the families, thank you, not just for what you presented today, but also for your work and dedication in the field in the past and being able to give us this optimism. And thank you so much for staying up so late to talk to us. Thank you very much. Thanks wow. to you, Brian. Thanks to you and the CJD Foundation. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.